Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Shelf Life for 2015 and our 100th show. We can hardly believe it's true. It seems like only yesterday that we started bringing you stories about writers and books from around the globe. We'll be continuing that tradition this year with another fantastic season. From children's literature, food writing, feminism, Australian fiction, and the relationship between the visual arts and text, we're going to be bringing you some of the best writers and artists working today. This year, we also have a brand new website where you find book reviews from us, past episodes, and information about festivals and other literary events. We're also on Twitter and Facebook, and we'd love to hear what you have to think about the show. But to get started with this week's Cracker episode, James Gulliver Hancock was born in Sydney, but now works in New York as a sculptor, animator, illustrator, and all-round major talent. A couple of years ago, he set himself the enviable task of drawing all of the Big Apple's buildings for a project rather aptly called All of the Buildings in New York. It's since morphed into a follow-up on Sydney buildings, but we caught up with him to talk about the New York project because, well, we can't help but love that city. But first, and much closer to home, we meet Luke Carmen. In 2014, Luke was selected as one of the Sydney Morning Herald's best young Australian novelists for his breakout collection, An Elegant Young Man. The book, which deals with some of my favourite things, alienation, displacement and unexpected hilarity, is set in Western Sydney, a place only just starting to be recognised on the map of Australia's literary landscape. An Elegant Young Man is a collection of short stories and monologues, all told from uh, the perspective of uh, a young man uh, from Liverpool, or uh, actually on a mountain on the outskirts of suburban Liverpool, a small mountain. And uh, it's about, if it's, uh, you know, it's, the, each story is um, self-contained, but uh, if the book in total is about anything, it's about uh, the young man's attempts to make sense of coming from uh, an incomprehensible part of an incoherent country. Or at least that's, what I, that's the line that I'm giving. My name's Luke, and sometimes at parties, when people ask me what I, I do, I say, I'm a professional fraud, how about you? And nobody ever laughs. To be honest, I don't go to a lot of parties. You know, I read in the newspaper yesterday that cocaine use has skyrocketed in Sydney despite police efforts. I guess it's good to know that somewhere out there people are having fun. Frank Sinatra said that he was for whatever gets you through the night, but according to the Bible, anyone who endorses, participates or watches Australian Idol and isn't very sorry is going to hell. The inspiration for the collection was my life. The narrator, who uh, by chance has the same name as me, and I have so much in common, it's really quite eerie. And um, so it's... The main thing that drew me to that character was sympathy. You know, I could really sympathise with his condition and his confusion and uh, uh, his struggle to make sense of himself and the, the world around him. So that's really where the story comes from. Also, uh, the, the book is set in uh, Liverpool, for the most part, in the, the suburbs of Western Sydney, and that's the most interesting place in Australia. Uh, I think Liverpool in particular is the most Australian part of the country, and there exists no, as far as I'm aware, uh, no fiction, no literary um, milieu for Liverpool. So I, I you know, I, I figured if uh, nobody else is going to do it, it might as well be me, you know. So that's where the, the collection comes from. I'm an English teacher now too, and I tutor this girl named Seren. And that's how you spell it. I try pronouncing it, but I can't get there. She tries to teach me, but I'm easily distracted. I'm supposed to be teaching about this Australian poet, Peter Szyzniewski. Apparently he's Polish. He has this book called Immigrant Chronicle. It was published in 1975. I think facial hair was big in 1975. And you know what the bizarre thing is? I was having a drink in Liverpool one time in a bowling club, and outside this guy sitting in the sun wearing an enormous overcoat. And the bizarre thing is, he looked exactly like old English teacher and he needed a shave. The reception to the book has been uh, far beyond anything that I uh, imagined. You know, this is the first uh, fiction from Liverpool, and uh, I, I didn't think anyone would be that interested, you know? I've been amazed. I was awarded the along with some other Australian writers, the 2014 Young Novelist uh, by the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, nominated for the Australian Literary Society Gold Medal, uh, which Alexis Wright won. And uh, now uh, Readings.com New Writing Award. My book is in the running for that. And the reviews have been amazing, incredible. Jordy Williamson from The Australian was the first to review it. And uh, the title of his review, the, he the, the headline for his review was Life flares in suburban void, which I thought was really interesting, uh, a really interesting way to approach the book. Um, but yeah, I can't really uh, exaggerate how uh, amazed I've been by the reception that the book has received uh, relative to what I expected. You know, it is, uh, people, you know, I talk about it like this and people tell me to relax because, you know, it hasn't been meteoric or anything, but 
uh, in terms of sales or whatever, but, uh, you know, far beyond what I expected. I've been drawing since I was a little kid, all the time. I just drew and drew and drew, and in high school I drew for people's bands and anything I could get my hands on, really. More so than keeping a diary, I was drawing the little things that I interacted with. Coming here initially, it was amazing to see these buildings that I'd grown up with on TV and, and uh, films, like you know, seeing Sesame Street, brownstones and stuff is amazing. It's like you, you almost can't see them for what they are. Drawing was a way to make them real for me. The buildings are so synonymous with this place. It's such a built environment that I needed to uh, engage with them consistently and every day and keep a diary of the buildings that I loved and saw and wanted to make my own somehow. In the beginning I was doing two or three quick sort of black and white ones on the way to work and on the way wherever, like in between places, I'd stop riding my bike and get off and pull out the sketchbook. As a tourist especially, you come here and you just walk around and marvel at things, you don't really stop and take in the details. For me, a drawing really makes me stop and concentrate on every little thing. Like if you're sitting out front of a building, you have to notice how many windows there are or that there's one missing on one floor or one's been bricked up. There's all these little quirks to things that I wouldn't see and I don't think other people would see unless you sit for quite a long time. I think New York definitely brings out big ideas from all the most creatives that come here. They, they see the sort of other people doing stuff and the, and the opp land of opportunity does kind of exist for us, I think. The book was really, the idea was to make a summary of where we're up to with the blog so far and, and add to it. Things tend to get picked up easier here. Like a major publisher probably wouldn't have published a book of building drawings in Australia. I, I think it's quite a, a risk maybe, whereas here with the, the, the love of New York the world has, they kind of, it's, a, it's almost a sure thing to publish a book of buildings. The response has been crazy for the whole project from the beginning. It's just it's gotten so much press constantly and people are always asking about it and wanting me to draw their building and interact. So it is a sort of love letter to New York, the, the book, in a way, collecting all my favourite buildings. Well, Art and About has been going for 13 years now and we choose a different theme every year and I guess in saying theme, things that are not necessarily rigidly, you know, stuck into it but, but sort of talk about different issues. This year we're looking at the endangered, so um, not necessarily at wildlife or the environment, the things that we know are endangered, but the things that we're not so aware of that we're losing. Art and About is uh, all about putting art in unusual places. Um, so not necessarily in, in you know, big parks or whatever, but it just in unusual nooks and crannies all through the city really, and some very public places. Well, we were looking for a wall that had very high exposure. There's a lot of ugly walls around the city and, and this may be the very first project of the city's to kind of you know, change that. First time I saw Elliot's work and it was aware that it was him, it was um, a beautiful piece in Stanmore. And then uh, another piece in Surrey Hills. I really liked the text work that he'd done. And then of course, when I found out who he was, I did a bit more research on him. And it's often very text-based and it's often very sort of, I wouldn't say message heavy, but it alludes to, you know, some messaging that we thought really fitted the theme of Art and About this year. The theme of the festival is endangered. I immediately thought of time. And, I mean, we're in a modern world where everything's busy and life's crazy, even for me personally. He was quite surprised when he saw the scale of the project. We were sitting in a cafe and then we went, let's go and have a look at the wall. And the look on his face when we said, you know, that wall up there was 
He was very excited because um, it's a massive, massive scale. They showed me a picture, but it didn't really click in my head how big it was. It looked big, but not this big. I had a big smile on my face. It was good. It was a good moment. I'll always remember that. It seems like as soon as you enter this zone, people just walking around, looking at their phones, looking at the floor. So I kind of wanted to inspire people to kind of harness the moments you have, make the most of your time and live in the present. So I've chosen the words here and now. The here is, you know, you're given this opportunity to be here and be alive. And the now is the action of taking that opportunity and making the most of it. I think it's relevant because, you know, we're right in the CBD. Everyone's in here to, to do something and to work and to you know, run around busily and everyone's taken up by something. I guess this is their chance to look up and seize that moment and just kind of take a breath and yeah. First few days were pretty scary. Getting onto it, it's pretty scary. And then once you're up there, it's, I, I love it. I love being up there. I wish I could work up on walls all the time. It's just something about working outdoors, up by myself. It's just such a good feeling. It's not mine anymore, it's, it's everyone else's. People, the city owns it, they can talk about it. Everyone has, interprets it in so many different ways and so it becomes its own thing, you know? It's its own organism that people control and affect and have opinions which change it and hopefully people like it. <laughs> Art and About have shown that, you know, there is an audience for this kind of work. There is an audience that wants to see artistic expression, whether it's visual arts, performing arts, street art, um, outside of the sort of normal confines of, of galleries and institutions. And I think people that think Sydney's got no soul need to get out more because it's certainly there from the small bars to the great food that we have to the great art, the great cultural institutions. Yeah, I think uh, get out more and you'll see it. If you're interested in seeing more of his work, Numskull painted the exterior of the Wetherill Park Library in a fabulously idiosyncratic manner, and more of his art can be seen on his website. Don't forget to keep an eye out for the next Art and About Festival, which in 2015 is presenting artworks throughout the year outside of its traditional spring festival dates. And coming up, find out what Oz Comic Con fans had to say about why they're such geeks. And then join us after the break to find out how a bunch of 20-something emerging artists spend their Saturday nights in Sydney's inner west. My favourite comic book is Iron Man. I'm a big Spider-Man fan. Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, I'm very new to the comic book scene at the moment. I just like that it's something completely original and unconventional. And like before we're reading it, I didn't think anyone did different variations of classic stories. So that's why I'm really enjoying that. To me, pictures and really good artwork is, is what keeps me interested. In. You just look at these pictures and it's kind of more interactive. So you can physically see what these characters are going through. My favourite book would have to be the Harry Potter series. <laughs> the picture has a thousand words. They're just a little bit more dynamic. Comics have a different side of life in them than books. I mean, books are really great and they're descriptive and stuff like that, but sometimes you don't feel that energy that you do in a comic. Be Batman and the Joker. He's charismatic and like, he gets done in the end, but has fun doing it. I don't really read any. I love the Captain America comics and the Avengers comics and X-Men. They're probably my three favourites. I just like all the characters. I'm Yui from Cardcaptor Sakura. Obviously, I'm a big Star Wars fan, so all the Star Wars trilogies. Less words. <laughs> a big thing that draws you into the comics is the fact that it's not only bringing together fantastic writers, but also amazing artists, and they come together to create this amazing piece of work that's really an artwork in itself. Uh, Jonathan from Star Maniac has always been a favourite of mine. I am Jack Frost from Rise of the Guardians. If I struggle to sort of get my head in the zone imagining something during an actual book, it, it's there. I can just immediately see what they were trying to say, and I can get immersed almost, you know, immediately without really trying. Welcome back. Now, if you've watched us before, you'll know I love events that get off the cultural grid. And that makes our next story about a night on Earth pretty much a hands-down winner. It's held in a warehouse in Sydney's inner west, actually this warehouse. And it's a fantastic fusion of creativity and collaboration. 
Bands, musicians, video artists, photographers and painters mix wares and mediums to create new and experimental approaches to storytelling. Yet, as this story shows, it's the slam poets who are really making their mark. With my head held low, letting you know I'm holding back a flood of emotion. I pause four seconds. One, two, three, I am a slam poet. I think it's extremely important um, that people get up and share their artwork. Well, The Night on Earth is about bringing a bunch of really amazing emerging artists in Sydney um, together and giving them a platform to kind of exhibit and perform their work. That's kind of what instigated this whole Night on Earth, to give you know, the emerging artists a platform. We kind of feel as though there's a home show where friends and family get to see what amazing talents there are, but then the next level is kind of more the professional exhibitions and performances, so we wanted to kind of be the middleman and provide something a bit bigger for those incredible home shows. Words of the baseline rhythm of 2nd Avenue and 116th that would explain the Spanish hymns that have started walking through my sleep. There's so many talented people here tonight and the fact that, you know, they haven't had their chance yet is, you know, sad. It's, you know, we're missing out on this great talent, so. The type of performance included in tonight is quite broad, which is why it is called Night on Earth. So we've got everything from slam poets to acoustic musicians to electronic to some video art to watercolorists and graphic design and yeah, like a bunch of everything really. I felt inspired to like get this kick started was because I just see so many of my friends and just meet so many people at so many places who are like, what do you do? I make music. What do you do? I paint. What do you do? I'm in a band. And you can see it just doesn't go anywhere because it's that whole lack of experience. It's not getting a shot. It's not knowing anybody. So we want to kind of be that friendly base for everybody to approach us, to come to us with what they want to do, and we make it happen. Like, regardless of how good you are at doing something, it's just you need experience to get somewhere. And that's pretty much what inspired it, just hearing so many people say they want to do something. So we want to keep it as a female collaborative as much as possible as well. We feel it's extremely underrepresented by women in this industry. I put the space together because I studied art in Melbourne, like painting and illustration and photography. And art in Melbourne is just thriving. And I came back to Sydney and I wanted to be a part of a working studio space that wasn't extremely expensive. And I couldn't find one, so I just thought I'd make one. I realised when um, I was listening to a whole bunch of people around me talking about Sydney having a lack of a creative scene, I don't know, just something in me like changed and I realised that everyone complaining about a lack of scene, it was an opportunity to actually contribute to it and make the scene that everybody wanted. I am a slam poet and in my final rant, my hands dance, helping me conjure wonder as my voice gets louder and louder, my words, they seem profounder and profounder until I stop. The poetry, um, so spoken word, which is something that we didn't actually consider in the first place, but it was really wonderful that someone suggested it to us. Um, so we're going to have a few poets stand up and perform for 15 minute pieces. I think we're forgetting that you have got poetry and you have got performance art and you have got spoken word, which does contribute to expression. And I think that's why we really liked to add it to the mix. A doorway in our brains that opens to oblivion and so Stockholm Syndrome. In my mind, it keeps repeating in my mind. Slam's only been around since something like 85, 86. And it came in from Chicago. So for it to be alongside art, like visual arts and uh, musicians. Um, it's pretty incredible that it has that much support that we're actually opening the show with something like, I don't know, six different artists, and then it's going to a DJ set. So it's just so current, so, so vibrant, so moving that we can be in a show like this and we can be alongside these other artists. And I think different forms of art instruct each other and they grow from that. I'm really excited about tonight. So the, the bands and the DJs and the artwork, I don't know, I just feel sort of like where the sort of the the awkward nerdy cousins being invited to some hip event like this and it's it's sort of like being invited to the cool kids table. This week I'm reviewing a book called Coming of Age. Targeted at young adults, it's a collection of 12 stories by Muslim Australians who share tales of growing up with a dual identity. As the introduction notes, Muslim people in Australia come from over 70 countries and represent a wide variety of cultural backgrounds, yet we're constantly fed one negative stereotype. That stereotype's been morphing since 2001. 
As one writer put it, her experiences in Australia before and after 9-11 are quite different. She writes, we went to sleep as migrants and we woke up as Muslims. There are stories by a beauty queen, a female boxer, a 10-year-old who decides he's an atheist, a rugby league star, a lesbian. As readers, we're challenged to consider the difference between a cultural practice and a religious practice, an aspect of the book I personally found really compelling. We read of the daily difficulties these young people face in their attempts to be Muslim and Australian simultaneously. One's shocked to discover she's different from other Arab girls. How another negotiates between her own values and those of Western expectations of romance. What you may or may not be surprised by is the fact that, of course, many aspects of these stories could have been written by teenagers from anywhere. Like all young people, they're questioning their own identities. They're dealing with the social, physical and emotional challenges of growing up. I learnt so much from this book and was ashamed at times by the depth of my ignorance of the diversity of Muslim culture. I'd recommend it to readers of any age. As anyone who has tried it will know, carving out a job as a professional artist in Australia is tough going. On the one hand, there's an argument to be made that things have never been better. The internet, social media and multimedia publishing platforms have opened up heaps of opportunities for artists in the form of networking and collaboration. And yet, making it as an artist, being recognised professionally and, let's face it, making enough money to pay the bills remains a struggle for a whole bunch of practitioners. How to keep going in the face of adversity or success and how to make the right choices that can sustain and not diminish the creative process are constant questions and they're not easily answered. Enter Fun Employed, Life as an Artist in Australia by Justin Hazelwood, a book that attempts to redress the lack of career guidance and support available to artists in this country. It looks at the complex and rarely straightforward career trajectory of the professional artist. And here, Hazelwood means any creative practitioner, be it in the visual, performance, screen or literary arts. Using his own experience as a jumping off point and the collective wisdom of some of the nation's most well-known creatives, Hazelwood explores starting out and giving up, the process of management and brand development, the risks attached to burning out the downside of fame, and apparently there are some, and the advantages of failure. Far from being a gooey lovey on living the creative dream, although there is a little bit of that because, well, let's face it, it's not always hard, Fun Employed explores the economies of arts practice from both a cultural and political perspective. It looks at mental health and well-being, securing funding and surviving Centrelink, and the pitfalls of underestimating what it takes to sustain a career. While there were parts where I felt the narrative voice was prone to bouts of self-indulgence, you know, there are these passages where the author seems overly keen to assert himself as an artiste, something that kind of feels odd and a bit awkward. This is balanced out with enough self-deprecating humour to not leave a bad taste in the reader's mouth. It's a great book for any emerging or mid-career artist, and it's got a cute-as-hell trailer, which you can find on YouTube. That will make you fall in love with the book and Hazelwood more than just a little bit. To celebrate the theme of this week's episode, Words on the Street, Shelf Life is giving away a set of great books about talented artists. All you have to do to win this collection is visit the Shelf Life website and tell us in one paragraph who your favourite Australian artist is and why. Write your entry in the contact section and make sure you put Words on the Street competition in the subject line. Good luck. Well, that's all from us this week. Thanks for joining us for our 100th episode. We hope you've enjoyed the writers and the artists we've featured. Next week, we'll turn our attention to writing and performance, crossing into theatre and cinema. We'll bring you stories about the live, live cinema and the exciting project that led to the digitisation of the Bodleian first folio of Shakespeare's plays. If you can't wait a whole week to discuss all things wordy and creative, then give us a shout out on social media or catch up on any of today's stories at our brand new website. Till next week then, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.